Amen. And tonight we're doing the series on community, and I want to talk about communities that concerns uh, intentional relationships. And intentional relationship really does mean intentional relationship, right? Like we got to be intentional about our relationship. Okay. Well, that's all I had. I was hoping you guys would have caught that one. I'm kidding. No, it's, listen, with relationship comes vulnerability. And tonight we're going to really dig deep in our souls, in our hearts, right? We have to really analyze ourselves because the things that I listed about relationship cannot be done without Christ, without the Spirit of God, okay? Now, I'm going to talk about things like love and forgiveness and all those things. And some of you will say, I don't know if I can do that. Listen, I just want to put you in the mindset of Jesus, are you, for, are you in repentance mode to receive love, forgiveness, and all those things, right? Can we really truly say we have that of the Lord? Paul actually wrote about it in 1 Thessalonians, and I'm not going to get uh, too heavy into this particular scripture, but he said, we as the apostles proved gentle, he wrote this to the Thessalonians, we proved gentle among you. As, nurse, as a nursing mother tenderly cares for her children, he said, having so fond of an affection for you, we had an affection for you, and we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel, but our own lives too. He said they had such an affection towards the body that they imparted their own lives to them. It was intentional for them. They wanted to unify, and the reason why I believe we're doing these on Wednesday night is because when you take another day out of your week, you're serious about coming to Revive and being a part of the body, amen? And so what we're hoping through this series is it's imparting into you community so that on Sundays we're teaching others community too, amen? As we practice, we disciple, amen? We're called to be disciples of others, and we're supposed to disciple especially in this. And what I mean, this is what Paul was saying. It's a very picture of Christ to us, that if Jesus saved us and he called us, the Bible says, then he must be the focus of community. I know that seems simple, but it's really not. And I'll tell you why, because a lot of the times, do we really focus on Christ in our relationships? Listen, relationships that we have in church are not to be only natural. They're to be supernatural. They're to be above the world. Our relationships in the church should be above reproach. They shouldn't be, look the same as when we used to have relationship in the world. Amen? Because we're, we're serving a God who's holy. He's just. He's perfect. He's good. He's righteous. He's giving. He's apprehended me. Right? Therefore, if there's brothers or sisters in our, in our, in our path right now in our churches who are walking in contrary to the things of God, Right? It's our job to be supernatural to those people and say, look, we're off the path. Let's get on the path together. Amen? If there's people walking in the faith, we're to admonish those people and disciple with them and learn from them. Amen? So it's a two-way street. And so <clears throat> there are times of fun and laughter. I love those times. I love having fun. I like laughing. I like joking and cutting up and times of trials and struggles too. And I, I think the perfect picture of that is when Christ is on the cross, right? And I'm, I'm reading that story. If you, if you guys, if, if you haven't watched The Passion of the Christ, you must be living under a rock, but if you've watched Passion of the Christ, can you not feel what Christ went through in some semblance, in some sense of like, dang, the agony. I'm just gonna tell you, boss, when you were up here talking about the struggle, I can feel that. You can feel that struggle. So there's times of rejoicing, there's times of weeping. There's times of trial. There's times where friends of ours are angry. And you know what? We have to go there and minister to them in those times, right? But hopefully, we're in that relationship to draw them higher to Christ, amen? To not just say, okay, I get that you're angry. I'm just gonna sit here in your anger. No, 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 no. I'm gonna pray over you the peace of God that passes our understanding so that you're not angry anymore, amen? And so this is the question I have tonight. At the end of the day, ask yourselves this question. Were people edified by me or not? Were they able to see the Christ in me or the human side of me? Were they getting the new man or the fleshy massy? That's a real question, y'all. Were they getting the new man that is found in Christ or were they just getting the fleshy side of me? Were they getting my, my scraps because I wasn't really focused on Christ in this relationship? Amen? Amen. Does my wife get the scraps? Like when I come home, I literally have to decompress in my truck or my car. I have to go home and sit in the car for 10 minutes and pray and say, look, my kids don't care about what happened today. You know what they want? Daddy. 
And they don't deserve the scraps. They don't deserve the leftovers. They deserve all of me in Christ. They deserve all of daddy as a father, right? So does my wife. And so we have to really analyze where our relationships come from. Colossians 3 says this, if you have your Bibles, Colossians 3 says this, verse 1. Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things which are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on things of the earth. Set your mind on things above. If our eyes are fixed on Christ, do we pull people up to fixate their eyes on Christ or keep them focused horizontally on fleshy things? That really is the question. Is our relationship focused on bringing people to Jesus? Verse 3 says this, For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Verse 4 says this, When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you will be revealed with him in glory. Listen to this next verse. He goes right to right to what sin is. Therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality. Consider your bodies dead to immoral things, right? To impurity. What is impure in my life? I'm supposed to be dead to that. I'm supposed to crucify that. It also says uh, we're supposed to be dead to passions, to evil desires and greed. All those things amount to idolatry, it says. There's two sins in the Bible that the Lord says to flee from, lusts and idolatry. He says, run, run from it. It will keep you. I believe a lot of the times when we're in the spirit of stupor or when we have a spirit of divination, a lot of the times we make idols of things we don't even realize. And so that idol becomes where expectation is not met. And then we get in this funk where all of a sudden now we're repenting of things or we don't even repent because we're like, I'm just mad, Lord. I'm frustrated. I don't understand, Father. And idolatry creeps in so quickly we don't even see it. And guys, I'll tell you, maybe this is a pet Maybe you can relate, Rick. I'm sure all of us can. When you've been in ministry so long, it becomes an idol if you don't watch out and be careful. And it overtakes your family. I, I, I can tell you now, my 14-year-old is an amazing kid. I love Isaiah. He's awesome. But the first five years of his life, I neglected him because I was out saving the world and the world needed to get saved. And I had to go out there and my kid was suffering because daddy wasn't home. You know what I love though? I quit saying I regret it because God's redeemed the time for me. And that kid is amazing, and he's a man of God, and that dude will change the world. He will. And so if you're in that season of your life where you're like, man, I have regrets, God can redeem those times, folks. He can. I'm living testimony of it. I'm living testimony of it. Let's keep going, sorry. The later verse, in verse 12 in Colossians 3 says this, so as those who have been chosen by God, holy, and beloved, he says this, put on, put on a heart of compassion, put on a heart of kindness, put on a heart of humility, put on a heart of gentleness, and put on a heart of patience. I'm just going to ask you guys, analyze yourself right now. Do you do that practicing in your relationships with people? Patience, gentleness, honor. Yo, I ask myself these questions. You know how hard that is? It can't be done without the Spirit. It can't be done without fixating your eyes on Jesus Christ. It can't be. And folks, this isn't just words on paper. These are legit commands from God. This is how our relationship should be in our churches, in our body. You want to develop community? That's how we act. We put on the heart of gentleness. We put on the heart uh, of, of compassion and kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Listen to this. I fear we don't do this enough in our relationships. We're supposed to be bearing one another and forgiving each other. We're supposed to bear one another. How many of you guys have been in these relationships in the church where the people are just missing it? They're annoying. And you've told them time and again, dude, don't you see what's going on? Can't you see it? And you're like, I'm done, Lord. I'm done. I don't know what to, amen? I'm done, Lord. I don't know what to do. I'm done with them. And you know what the Lord says? Wasn't I loving kind to you? I'm not saying get in the trench with them. You can get dirty. What I'm saying is pull them out of the fire, the Bible says. Right? And then he says this in verse 14, beyond all these things, put on love. <laughs> I'm looking at that list and I'm going, isn't that love? 
That whole list I'm supposed to put on, isn't that love? He goes, no, love covers a multitude of sins. That when you have love, all those things become simple to do. Because people are in sin. There's people out there. In our churches too, let's be honest, right? We've all had those moments where we've gone around the mountain a hundred times, amen? Who, has re- who can relate to that? Going around the mountain. I thought I learned the lesson, didn't learn the lesson. And I was like, I learned the lesson, Lord. And then you're back in the trial, you're like, I thought I learned the lesson. You know how you know you didn't learn the lesson? You just asked him, didn't I learn that lesson? You didn't learn the lesson. When you learn the lesson, you learn to shut your mouth and just walk in it. And your testimony is your walk before God. And words are come after, amen? So here's a few things that I think about that is a healthy, godly relationship and it builds community. Number one, this is simple, but I hope this ministers to you. Love. If y'all could read 1 Corinthians 13 without feeling some kind of like, Lord, I'm convicted by this, it should rock your world. Listen, folks, I love the prophetic as much as the next guy, but this is what convicts me. He says, you could have the prophetic gift and know all mysteries and have all knowledge. If you don't have love, you have nothing. I could know the word of God and have all the mysteries, but no love is nothing. And it's not saying don't have the knowledge and don't get the mysteries. What it's saying is when you have love behind it, it transforms people. The love of God is shed abroad in my heart, it says in Romans 5, by the Holy Spirit, which was given to me to transform the souls of men. And he gives me the unction and the words to speak. The more revelation I get, the more he can use when I'm out on the streets and I don't know what to say. The more he can use those scriptures. Why was I reading that? Why did I memorize that? Why did I spend those two years in the basement, Lord, putting three by five cards all over the basement of scriptures? Why was I praying over them? Because when I started street preaching, he would bring them back to remembrance for the people. That's how how he did it. I thought I was crazy. I'm like, why am I doing this, Lord? And yet it was for the people. He says love. And he says this in John 13, 34. A new commandment I give to you, listen, that you love one another as I have loved you. You know that whole sermon series Pastor Todd did on marriage? Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Can anybody just stop, especially men, just hear me out. How do we love as Jesus loves? You can when your eyes are fixed on him. You really can. He says, and I, and I started to think about, how do, how, do I love people as Christ loved me and loves me? Do I really love people that way? 1 Peter 4 says this, And above all things, have a fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. When love covers a multitude of sins for you, you want to run to Christ, right? Anybody who's been in sin in this room and have walked in like some kind of conviction, maybe even a condemnation, don't you want to run into a loving arm? Do we practice that with our brothers in community when they really need it? Or do we maybe sometimes shuck them when they're trying to call us? You're like, oh no, I don't want to talk to them right now. You know why you're laughing? Because it's true. And I'm, I was guilty of it. Trust me. I know. It's hard. It's difficult to love this way. But when you truly have the love of God, when you have love in you, you overlook the stuff they're doing. And it, you say, to, literally, it goes in your heart. He says to you, I know where they're going. I'm not looking at where they're at. See them where I'm taking them. Don't look at them where they're at right now because where they're at is just a stumbling block. Help them get rid of the stumbling block, amen? Help them get rid of it. Have empathy toward one another. Listen, empathy empathy towards someone does not mean acceptance of sin. Just because you have compassion to someone doesn't mean you accept them in their sin. Does this make sense? Just because you're empathetic to someone who's in deep sin does not mean you accept where they're at. As a matter of fact, quite the opposite. It means compassion toward a fellow believer to help them approach the throne of God. Hebrews 4 says this, For we don't have a high priest, Jesus. We don't have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things just as we are. Not as we were. Even now I'm being tempted with things, right? He said he was tempted in all points like we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us, community, let us approach the throne of grace 
with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace for our help in the time of our need. Maybe, just maybe, we're supposed to be loving, kind, and empathetic to them to help them approach the throne of grace. Because I promise you this, if community was truly operating, less people would come in here heavy and burdened. They would come in here ready to rejoice and receive. If we could just reach out to those people that God is telling us to, hey, reach out to that person. Hey, send pastor a text. I'm not saying to send pastor a text, just an example. Send pastor a text, man. I love you, buddy. You were just on my heart. There are people here, I don't even have your numbers, and I look at you, and I'm sitting over here praying for you because God put you on our hearts to pray for you, right? I meet with uh, Austin right here in the morning. I mean, we meet every week. And this dude, he shocks me every week because he's solid. He's strong. He's crazy too sometimes. But you know what I love about him? He always says, dude, I'm really focusing on Christ right now. I need Jesus. How many of you all want a 17-year-old like that? I wish I had that at 17. I wasn't even thinking that way. And dude, he is answering your prayers. He is. The hardships bring reality. They bring the spirit. Let him do it, man. Let him have his perfect work. <clears throat> Can we truly help one another if we don't have compassion? to help our body in their trouble and their needs. Here's point number two after love, purposeful affection. I know some of you don't like that word. That sounds weird, affection. It doesn't mean sexual. It actually means good deeds towards one another in love, okay? Purposeful affection. John, 1 John 3, 17 through 18 says this, but whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? He says in verse 18, little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed first, then the truth. You know, sometimes people don't need your, <laughs> I was writing this out today, I'm like, how many of you guys have ever been in a hard situation? And you know, people, they became the immediate consultant. Oh, brother, you just got to trust the Lord. He's in it for your good. Say that to my light bill, man. God is in this for my good. Send it in with a stamp. Someone told me to pray about it, so I put that on my bill. I'll pray about it. Thanks. <laughs> Poop, lights off. I was praying about it. Sometimes blessing your brother, sister, sometimes blessing first and then saying God works things all together for good does more. Your deeds do more than your words do. And I've learned this principle, man. Deeds are such, they're so important. Sometimes they speak louder than your words do. I've often found people will hear the truth. Uh, sometimes like when I have to talk to people about hard things, I was thinking about like, hey, how does, how does that work? I think truly people hear truth from like us, like a Rick or Pastor Todd, because you really genuinely know our hearts. You know that we're in this for you. We know that you're, we're here to serve you. We're not here to take anything from you. I don't have a heart to take from you. I've got enough. God has supplied all my needs according to his riches and glory. I am seriously good. Therefore, because of that, I have no need to take anything from you. You know what I love? When you grow up in the truth. I love when you're bearing fruit. I love to see new people do new ministry things and leaders grow up. Amen? I love being a part of our elders meetings to see this church grow in a whole new way. I love hearing about reconciliation stories with parents and their kids. I love seeing people get elected to school boards and get shot up for it. In the words, I mean... They're getting shot up for it, but yet they're willing to stand because of the adversity. And they're willing to stand through the adversity to see God move because our kids are at stake. That fills my tank. That fills my joy. So think of all the ways Jesus showed affection to people. Y'all, he ate meals with tax collectors. Would you all eat meals with the IRS if they knocked at your door? You know why you're laughing. April 15th, right? It's a day you're all praying. Oh, God, help me today. Or some of you are saying, thank you, Jesus, rebates, right? But would you eat dinner with the IRS? Because, you know, those people are people too, and they need Jesus. Could we eat dinner with the IRS? Uh, Jesus washed the feet of his disciples. Could we truly wash the feet of those around us? 
in a true demonstration of love. I'm sorry I don't let anybody touch my feet. That's just my personal thing. Don't ever ask me to do it. I'll probably reject you. Do it in the spirit. My feet is nasty, okay? He, <laughs> I'm just, hey, we're community, right? I'm just sharing. I'm, I'm, I wrote it down, just saying. He put his, <laughs> thank you, Lord. He put his hand on the heads of children when he blessed them. You know, Jesus imparted his giftings to the people. Jesus sat with his disciples and taught them over and over and over and over again until they got it, until they could fully receive from him what he was trying to tell them. Do we do that? Are we willing to sit with people until they get it? Amen? He fed a huge, well, several times, he fed huge crowds. How many of us say, I'm just not a hospitable person? Maybe the Lord's calling you to be hospitable. Stretch yourself a little bit, amen? Maybe he healed the sick, cleansed the lepers, raised the dead. Look, y'all, I don't know. I love the more, but I want to see that. I want to see the dead come to life. I want to see it with my eyes, not because of the miracle, but because of the faithfulness to his word, because he is God, and he wants to do those things, and he wants to bless people with that. He wants them to see, the, the, the Bible actually says this, that they find their faith in the power and demonstration of the Spirit of God, not in man's words. Let them find their faith in the power and demonstration of God. Do we operate in the Spirit of Christ for our brothers, amen? Matthew 20, 25 says this, you know that rulers of the Gentiles lord, lord it over them, and those who are great exercise their authority over them, it should not be so among you, he says. Whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. Do we serve our brothers? Point number three, patience. This is another component we need as a community, is patience. Folks, how many of you guys are impatient? Can we just be honest here? We're a community. I like Wednesday nights. I'm impatient sometimes. Oh, come on. Thank you. Not the only one. Jeez. Community, honesty, integrity. <laughs> Psalm 103, real fast. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in mercy. Father, I pray for Dale and Gloria right now and their family. And the things they've had to endure, I pray, Father, you return the seeds of righteousness to them. I thought about y'all when I wrote that down. That their son would come to know you. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Almighty. So gracious and merciful they are. And they're not perfect, Lord, we know that. But Lord, you're perfect in them. And Father, you perfect them in that walk. In Jesus' name. How many of us have been around the mountain before? Well, I've already talked about this with a particular sin or vice or needed to learn a lesson. <laughs> How many of us love to hear this? I can't believe you're still struggling with this. Why can't you just repent and turn? Don't you just want to slap people? <laughs> Do you think I don't want to get rid of this vice? Right? I've met people who smoke, like smoke cigarettes, and they want to get rid of that vice. And I'm just like, dude, just put it down. This is when I was 21, 22, okay? Just saved as a Christian. Just put it down. And they're like, shut up, kid. <laughs> oh, how dare you? You don't trust enough. I used to say this kind of stupid stuff because I didn't understand community. I didn't understand bearing one another's burdens. I didn't understand prayer or impartation. I didn't. I didn't get it. And you know what? There are people who are struggling with this. And again, they need you to walk with them. Amen? They need you to walk with them through their marriage issues, through their kids' issues. They need you to walk with them. Because, listen, maybe you have a blessed marriage. Let's go disciple others who need that too. Amen? Thank you, thank you Christ, who gives long-suffering and who is long-suffering. Colossians 1 says this, that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power unto all patience and all long-suffering. He just said we can have all patience and all long-suffering as we're being strengthened in the faith. 
Folks, if we're truly long-suffering like he is, listen, do we truly love like Jesus is the question. (laughs) If he's long-suffering with me, can't we be that to our brother, sister? Amen? Can we be that to our kids? (laughs) Oh, come on. Sometimes we have short fuses, amen? You know who you are. I'm not looking. I ain't pointing. I'm kidding. The reality is, can everybody turn to their neighbor quick, whoever you want to pick, and just say this to them. I'm not pronouncing this over you. It's just true. Just say to your neighbor, you're going to make mistakes. Right? You're going to make mistakes. That's not an announcement. That's not a, you know what, Jared? We're going to screw up, right? We're going to make mistakes unless you're Jared. He's perfect. We're going to make mistakes. Listen, folks, listen. Do you think we're going to make mistakes? Are we going to do some dumb things sometimes against each other? Can we just accept that? Can we just as a community accept the fact that we're not perfect, but we're serving the perfect? That we're serving the one who is? And that I'm asking God to perfect me every single day? Can we just accept the fact that that happens so we don't have to carry around bitterness because of uncommunicated expectations? Can we just accept the fact that we're human and that I need Christ every single minute of my life? That, my friends, is community. Knowing that we're flawed, but we're serving together the one who isn't. And that we need him together. And we need him for our families. We need him for the church. Because the church needs to be the true representative of Jesus on earth. That's what we need, amen? If we're truly going to take territory, we need people to come in here knowing that we're broken, but we're serving the one who puts us together. Amen? Amen. Lastly, forgiveness. I ain't going to preach to y'all about forgiveness. How many of y'all heard sermons about forgiveness before? How many of y'all didn't even need sermons on forgiveness? It's kind of a duh. We forgive, right? I could throw you a thousand sermon titles. Todd, Pastor Todd's done several sermons on forgiveness and different ways of forgiveness, and I could throw you a hundred scriptures right now. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. And I'm not going to sit here and tell you that forgiveness is easy. And for those of you that think you deserve forgiveness and you're still walking in your sins against one another, repent. Repent now. Listen, I come to God in repentance and he forgives me. I'm not saying that's the only caveat, but we should never be at odds with one another. If we're not repentant, there's going to be no forgiveness there. To receive, I mean. To receive. Someone can forgive you, but if you're not ready to receive it, you're not going to change. Forgiveness is just as much for the person doing the forgiving as much as you receiving it to understand how to love. It's a release, amen? Amen. It's in the little things as well as the big things. If I can be honest, (laughs) I wrote this down. I've held grudges before with people because I felt like I couldn't jive with them. You know what I'm saying? Like, I just don't think I get along with them. And so I used my discernment as a cover-up to hold a grudge. (laughs) Guys, listen. Do not use the word discernment as holding a grudge against one another. Don't tell the Lord, well, I just, that's why I won't hang out with them because my spirit's discerning. If you've never talked to them, if you've never prayed for them, if you've never walked with them, do not use discernment as an excuse to not love your brother. That's not discernment, folks. You know what discernment really teaches you to do? To pray for them. I heard a guy tell me one time, that person is wicked and that's how they are. And I'm like, cool. Did you take them to prayer and fasting? No, I'm here to tell you that they're wicked. And Did you take them to prayer and fasting? Here, did you tell them? What are you telling me for? What am I going to do? Go up to that person and say, uh, I was told you're wicked and evil? God bless. Good morning. Thanks for coming. What am I supposed to say? Sometimes discernment teaches you to get on your knees and fast for them. What if your discernment is telling you there's something off in them and you're, by your prayer and fasting would break those chains from them? What if... Folks, that's community, man. 
See, our community and the body should be supernatural. It's not like the world. It's not superficial. It doesn't have conditions. We want God to be an unconditional loving God, don't we? But do we hold conditions against each other? That's not community, man. Brother Rick, I would have loved to have known you 25, 30 years ago. I would have because I hear stories about you and how you've changed. And then you tell stories about you know, people in our church, Todd and all these other things and how things have changed. I would have loved to have known just a piece of that to see God's transforming work in you. And it was the people in your life discipling you and you listening and you praying and you seeking God. And now you're here discipling other people doing that very thing. Amen? I love that about you. I want everyone to stand real fast. These are some areas, and there's plenty more. I could probably, we could preach on this subject two, three weeks in a row. There's probably more areas to build relationship on, but these four should have convicted you enough to go to prayer tonight and say, Lord, I need to work on these. Amen? Just these four should have been like, man, it's enough for me to say I need community in our church. Amen? It's enough for me to say I love my brother enough to be a brother and a sister to them. Amen? That's what it means. <clears throat> Um, God, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful that we're doing this mini-series on community, Father. I'm grateful for the culture that you're developing in this church. This is the year of the Holy Spirit. And I pray, Father, that each one of us understands that the year of the Holy Spirit brings out things in us that are not pretty sometimes. But, Lord, that together we're going to you, Father, approaching your throne of grace to say, Lord, take it from me and put your heart in me. Put the heart of patience, the heart of love, the heart of community. Father, people in this room, I pray if they're hardened right now, I pray you soften their heart. Father, you would remove their stony heart and put in a heart of flesh, Lord. And you would show them and put on their minds and their hearts to text that person, to reach out to that person, to pray for that person. God, I thank you, Lord, in true community, Father, that we would learn to repent of our sins, Father. That someone wouldn't have to point it out to us, that Holy Spirit, you would quicken us to that. So we wouldn't have, need brothers to point it out, Father, that we can walk in true community. Lord, I also pray this, Father, that each one of us learns to watch each other's back. To watch each other, to walk side by side, not behind them, Lord. Teach us, Father, that it's not about walking behind, it's walking with them. And that we wouldn't have that marriage, that friendship, that relationship destroyed by a lie, by deceit, by uncommunicated things, Lord. That we can come now, Father. Even tonight, I pray that, Father, you would release something in people that they could be honest tonight with those who maybe they've harbored a bitterness to, maybe an uncommunicated thing. Father, I thank you tonight. Tonight is the beginning of something for some, for all of us, to walk in true community, Lord. And Lord, I didn't even call up the prayer ministers, but I'll pray this, Father, that you would heal tonight in the name of Jesus. Heal. Heal tonight the anointing of healing over this place in the name of Jesus. You would strengthen our bones in Jesus' name. You would strengthen our minds, Father. I thank you, Lord, for restoration, Father, where it needs to be restored. Financial breakthrough in the name of Jesus Christ by the authority you've given us, Lord, to walk in. What a blessing to be in a house that just wants to love you, Lord. We don't get it all the time, but thank you, Lord, for showing us that we don't and that you do and you're putting it in us. In the name of Jesus, Lord, amen. Amen. God bless you guys. See you on Sunday. Thank you for joining us today at Revive Us Now at our YouTube channel. Remember to click that subscribe button to Revive Church and share this video with a friend. And if you'd like to support this ministry, go to reviveusnow.com forward slash give.